Welcome to Learning with Lisa, Student Success Beyond Expectations podcast with Lisa Navarra, award-winning educator, consultant, behavior specialist, author, and parent. Welcome to Student Success Beyond Expectations. Today, we bring you Ashley Cross. She has overcome many challenges as she's been diagnosed with mood disorder later on with ADHD and tells us that she really thinks she had anxiety as early as five years old. Ashley is an inspiration because she continues to and has overcome so many challenges, but she truly remains so optimistic that she wants to share her insights and her information with all of us so we can have a deeper understanding with children and adults who have the same type of challenges and experiences in their own lives. So welcome, Ashley. Thank you for having me, Lisa. Absolutely. Absolutely. So where would you like to begin? I mean, you have had such a journey uh, all the way from just my introduction to now you are a career coach. So, I mean, I know you've taken so many of your experiences into your work. So maybe we should begin with some of your early childhood experiences and what they looked like for our listeners. Yeah, so like you said, uh, I believe I did have anxiety as early as age five. Um, For the longest time, I didn't have the words to describe anxiety. So I said I suffered from an overactive imagination. Overactive imagination. How many of us have heard kids say, well, I don't know, I was just imagining. Or we think as educators or parents, my kid is really, really creative. So if that could be you, listen to what Ashley has to say. I think that she gives a little bit more of a, a perspective on what that could mean for some kids. Yeah, so the overactive imagination also plays with the ADHD. I I love daydreaming. I love thinking of new uh, creative ways to express myself, whether that was through my clothes, through acting, through dancing, through writing a lot. Um, and then also w- when it comes to the anxiety piece, a big characteristic early on for me were anxiety nightmares or night terrors. Um, Can you tell us about that? What does that look like? What is that? Yeah, so uh, these, uh, you'll see some common themes with kids like calling uh, bus driving off a bridge or uh, getting eaten by a shark or uh, I I was from Florida, so crocodiles chasing me in the yard, something like that, or uh, an alien one that I still remember to this day because of E.T., Wow. Um, And so uh, these anxiety nightmares, uh, I would actually think about them for long periods of time. So could be a day or even two days afterward. And I would just notice feeling a little extra tingly in my body. Yeah. Um, And that uh, later I learned that's called hypervigilance, where you're kind of ready to react to something, whether it's there or not, because you're expecting something bad to happen. So you're actually like believing your your nightmares. Mm-hmm. Imagine and, a child, that's it's horrible. It sounds so yeah. scary. And I think a lot of children, it's just really common. We don't know what all is in the dark. Sometimes we watch horror movies or sometimes our right. friends scare us. Um, so I think that need for safety early on is so important, especially for somebody with anxiety. And uh, it wasn't until college I really had tools to use with anxiety. So I did want to provide you guys with a couple quick tips for somebody who maybe is struggling early on with something like this. Uh, sure. Sure. Give us some tips, especially how, how you can work yourself out of that hypervigilance feeling. Yeah. So one of my favorite things, uh, and I used to work with children as well as a child therapist. Uh, so it has to do with the senses. So anxiety is all about in your head, what if, what if. You start spiraling out of control uh, and it takes you out of the present moment and it takes you out of your body basically. So grounding is a great technique to bring you back into focus in the body. So this uh, technique, you focus on the five senses. So spot five things you can see. So for me, I might focus on the color green, look around the room and focus on five green things. Now. Focus on four things you can hear. So it might be the laptop rumbling, might be birds in the air, might be the air conditioning humming, something like that. Now focus on three things you can feel. The warmth on your body from the sun, the 
the texture in the chair or the texture of your clothes on your skin. Then two things you can smell and one thing you can taste. And so also having mint or gum nearby can also oh. bring somebody out of that anxiety spiral. Wow. Yeah, that's that's pretty wild and it's quick. And if you can't mm-hmm. overcome, like get control of your thoughts to ground yourself, I would imagine just grabbing that mint or that piece of gum might be the quickest, easiest way to start that, that healthier cycle. Definitely. And uh, anxiety also can present as... Um, some GI issues like upset tummy or right. butterflies or like that tingling sensation, like things, bad things are going to happen. Yeah. Um, and then smell is also a really helpful way to reassure somebody. So smell is very linked in the brain to memory. So if you, uh, if a child has a favorite smell, for example, I love lavender. So if I have a lavender uh, spray that can help calm me down or relax me, or maybe like the smell of, uh, again, I'm from Florida. I've got key lime pie flavored candle that I'll I'll use some days when I get to in my head and I just want to refocus and be present. Mm -hmm. That's fantastic. So that's grounding to help children who are either daily and they're going through um, an episode of being anxious or to help to decrease that hypervigilance feeling due to an anxiety-induced nightmare, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, that's fantastic. Great information right there. Um, So tell us more. Tell us more about the the mood disorder. What is that? And what are some signs that people can take note of? And what should we do? Yeah, so mood disorders do run in my family. Um, And so that probably started to develop more when I was a teenager around the time I got my period. Um, So it was hormonally driven. Uh, It was very intense. Uh, I would be crying for days or very angry, especially in high school. Um, And I, I would also suffer from debilitating periods where I was in bed for two days, uh, sick with cramps um, and also over-personalizing things. And I think this is a big thing for women, especially who have combined like anxiety or mood disorders, uh, is that over-personalizing things. I am bad. I should not be this way. I feel broken. And, uh, combine that with the ADHD and it becomes a bit of a hot mess. Yeah. Uh, Yeah. It's probably hard to control some of those thoughts to begin with. Now you have ADHD, mm-hmm. you don't know which one to hear first, I would imagine. Right. It becomes very difficult. It, it's kind of like multiple voices in your head, but yeah. it it's not the dissociative piece. It's not the different identities in your head. Right. But um, from my work as a child therapist, we call it parts work. So, what do you call it? Say it again. Uh, parts work. So okay. um, the theory is called internal family systems. But basically, you've got parts of yourself that are trying to protect the sad child in you. Um, And so these parts can try to act like the parent, like the overprotective parent, that's the anxiety. Uh, And the overreactive parent is the mood. Right. So that's very clear for people too. mm -hmm. See it that way. And the internal family systems, we call them like the managers, and I think they're the firefighters. I think those are the two terms, the over over uh, parenting one, the overprotective one, and the overreacting one. And so when there's mood disorders, anxiety, uh, trauma, even uh, a lot of mental health plays into this framework. So it actually can be really helpful if a child's creative to start writing out, like, what are these parts? Go ahead and name them or uh-huh. give them a color and have them interact with each other and interact with your small kid version. And you feel like that would be helpful for them. What is that that, mm-hmm. that outlet? What do you think does for people to be able to do that? Yeah, it it helps them stop to see it as part of themselves. Okay. It is part of yourself, but it externalizes it. It's mm-hmm. no longer who you are as a person. It's part of you. Um, so it's no longer, I am bad. Uh, it's this part of me is feeling hurt right now. Right, right. Um, and so by naming it, uh, I am no longer saying me or I, uh, and it helps me feel a little bit more distance from that emotion or that thought. Even saying phrases like, I notice I'm feeling blank. 
mm-hmm. instead of I'm sad. I notice I'm feeling sad. It I am such uh, I'm so in love with writing because the way we say things to ourselves and in writing reflects our whole worldview. So that's one of the easiest way to reframe things or change things, especially as a kid. Yes. Yes, which when we change from the negative to the positive to the reactive to the proactive, it's it's very powerful. <clears throat> Even when um, we're talking about mental health issues, as well as everyday people in everyday life, right? Mm-hmm. So the way that we talk to ourselves and to others has a direct impact on our feelings and behaviors. I think that's what you're saying. Exactly. And that's why therapy is so crucial and so important. I am very thankful for the therapists I've had over time and also for those creative outlets to help me start to develop these uh, tools as early as high school and college. Right. So now talk to us about that, about the developing of the tools. Did you find that there was a couple of strategies that you hold, you really hold on to because it's helpful? And then what was that transition like for you when you found something that was working and then you were coming to a happier, peaceful place? So I feel like the happier, peaceful place has only hit recently because I'm 30. (laughs) Uh, But well, how does age, how does age have to do with it? Yeah. So keep in mind, the brain continues to develop till you're 25. Yeah. So uh, the, the ways in which we are wired uh, when we are young Sometimes as adults, we have to unlearn the way our brain worked. Uh, So I would call it default mode. That would be my overly uh, paranoid or overly reactive state. I I would call that my default mode. And so it's taken me a long time to rewrite that internal code with the coping strategies I've learned through therapy and uh, I've learned through mindfulness as well um, to set a new default, a new baseline. Um, And so in uh, college, for example, having access to resources I didn't when I was in middle school and high school really helped helped me develop these skills. So I had access to a college counseling center, to a career center. Uh, I majored in theater. So the diving deeper into the expressive arts and thinking about like the psychology of lighting and uh, costumes, putting on uh, an outfit and feeling like a whole new person. Uh, These were some ways to get me out of a rut when Mm -hmm. I was feeling depressed or upset. Right, right. So really embracing the things that came naturally to you that felt good. Not asking you to play some sport. It wasn't, I mean, were you into sports at all? Uh, No. Uh, Well, I I was in middle school. Uh, My dad likes to joke that I would not uh, get kicked off the soccer team because even when they told me I couldn't make it, I stayed on as an alternate even if I'd never played. Nice. Um, So I had that persistence uh, either way. And then I got into sports maybe more when I went to college and it was optional instead of PE. Right. So uh, working out was amazing. I enjoyed the Zumba dancing class, going to friends. Uh, That was really helpful. And just being outside, uh, even that, uh, I went to Florida Southern College in Florida And it has Frank Lloyd Wright architecture and tons of gardens, tons of spaces to hang out outside. So uh, all those different, uh, all those different resources really helped me come out of my shell. And really knowing what comes naturally, what makes you feel good, and then taking the action to immerse yourself in those areas sounds like a very healthy move. Definitely. A great strategy. So talk to us now about your career coaching. Tell us about this and and also make sure you tell us too how your experiences as a child, a student, and now an adult has helped you with the students that you work with. Yeah. So um, for the past uh, 10 years, I've been working with college students. Um, I went to grad school for mental health counseling, and as a grad assistantship, I started working in a career center, and uh, while I was learning the techniques of a counselor, and I really wanted to focus on children and adolescents, I was also realizing all this stuff about me, all the mental health issues, and learning the names for them. Oh, 
it was a bit of a challenge. It was kind of like uh, shattering a puzzle and putting it back together. Wow. <laughs> you know what? I think this is important because when we're able to label things that we've lived with for so long or tried to figure out to define it even more and you get to that point, it's it's life-changing. It really could be life-changing. Can we talk about that for a minute? Yeah, great. Definitely. Go, go there with us for, for a little bit. When you found out more information, just run with it. Yeah, and um, grad school was tough. And so I, uh, anybody who's thinking of going that path, uh, just you have been warned. <laughs> Uh, you will develop anxiety and depression in grad school, regardless. Of oh, no. <laughs> I said you were uh, optimistic. <laughs> so, uh, so the good news is because of grad school, I'm happier with who I am as a person. I have mm -hmm. way more resources and terminology to describe the experiences I've, uh, I've felt in my life. I've seen from my family and friends. And then also I've been able to help others because of it uh, in this awareness. Um, but like you said, it, it it's a paradigm shift. Your whole right. world changes. And so uh, going from this very anxious person who I had panic attacks every day on the way to grad school because I hated driving. And I drove an hour and a half to and from grad school on a very crowded road in uh, Florida. And so lots of lots of being surrounded by small metal boxes when I'm somebody who enjoys nature and right. being outside and relaxing. So um, having the terminology and being able to learn about the tools that others use to help people like me was uh, a real game changer. And like I said, I'm happier with who I am because of it, but it was an intense experience. So the career coaching was my outlet. The career coaching became my new theater, oh, basically. Yes. Um, it very was a communication lot based. Right. And it's very forward oriented. So I had to do some uh, trauma therapy as part of my program and part of learning to help others. Uh, so I took an extra year in my grad program. I worked at the career center an extra year and realized again, how much I love career because it's forward focused. It's very optimistic trauma. While we, we go deep and we make a huge impact. I would not be where I am today without trauma counseling, mm -hmm. um, but it's kind of a longer process. Whereas career, I can help somebody revamp their resume and start believing in some of their strengths as early as tomorrow. Right, right. So can you give us, does anybody come to mind at all? I know it's kind of a tricky question, but somebody come to mind where you felt like you could really relate to where they were in, in the process as the counselor? Yes, career all the time. Counselor. Yeah. Oh, good. Uh, pick one. <laughs> so obviously I can't get into specifics or anything. No, no, no. Um, but I, I see a little bit of myself and my students. So right now I work at Carnegie Mellon. Uh, I am an associate director of career services for a uh, highly specialized STEM master's program. And so I have these brilliant students top in the world uh, and they have to get these very competitive internships with big names like Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan, okay. places that have thousands of applicants for one internship. Wow. Wow. Uh, okay. it, it's intense and the process is very long. So remember how I mentioned that anxiety, depression that comes with grad school? I'm yes. seeing that in my students yes. because they are not only going through the toughest coursework in their life, but they're also trying to recruit for an internship. Um, and uh, they're kind of competing against each other. You take a lot of type A people, put them in the same program. It, it's intense, it's fun, but it's very challenging. So they might have panic attacks in my office one day and then uh, get an offer the next day. And it's very unpredictable in a way. Right, ups and downs and ups and downs. Sure, mm -hmm. when you have a lot of high achieving students and the pool of, of where they're applying for their internship, which they see as the first stepping stone, I would imagine, to like their future. And it's mm -hmm. so minimal for what's actually available that it can be extremely anxiety inducing. They're so yeah. lucky to have you because I bet you're very supportive and you come from a real place of understanding. I like to think so. Um, and I, I love working with the students. That's one of my favorite parts of the job. Um, just normalizing again that anxiety, that emotional roller coaster, because I've been through it too. 
Uh, it, it allows me to have this compassion and this empathy for them. And uh, what I've been working on over the past two years in this role is no longer like taking on their anxiety. Like I want to be mama bear. I want to protect them from these feelings. But ultimately that's not doing them any good as they go into adulthood. I have to teach them to make space for their own feelings. Right, right. So you're doing a little bit of your therapy work in there too, it sounds like. Definitely. The crisis counseling skills, the trauma skills, uh, the career coaching, it all comes together. And that's what I love about uh, careers as well. And you'll probably see this from your students as they're growing up. We always think it's such a linear line between what we want to do and what we're doing after college. It's not. No. Uh, I wanted to be a theater person over in New York yeah. uh, when I graduated high school. And then I went to college, enjoyed my time in college, kept going to colleges to work. Uh, and now I'm working at Carnegie Mellon, uh, not performing, but I'm helping people. <laughs> right. Right. That's incredible. I, I changed majors too, two years in. All I knew was I wanted to help people. Then I narrowed it down to, well, deafness is an interest of mine. So then I, I was a student for speech and hearing, but it was very clinical and it was more audiology. And I didn't know if I wanted sign language. Worked at a small job in the mall and at a pagoda. And the next pagoda, there was somebody attending a college for dual certification for general education, special education. Before I knew it, I transferred my whole school, my whole program and everything. I think that's something really important, especially like my son, he's in 12th grade now, just graduated. So I guess he's no longer in 12th grade, is he? And so he's going to University of Miami. So he's going to Florida too. And um, he has in mind what he wants to do. And he has that type of mind where usually he, he says something, he does it, he makes it happen. But I keep telling him it's okay if you change your mind. Yeah. And we're nowadays people aren't staying at the same job for 20 years. Right. Uh, and so it's really normal for this generation and millennials to change jobs every two to three years. Wow. And it's uh, it's less about going to school for a career. It's more going to school to learn the skills for who you want to be. Mm -hmm. And then you figure out ways to make those skills work. But a lot of the jobs we go to school for haven't even been created yet. I mean, Think about 2002 and the concept of Uber. Right. Right. Or yeah. Etsy or anything like that. Yeah. Um, technology is constantly changing. We are. So going to school, choosing a major, choose what you love, but focus on the skills uh, and be open to new experiences. I think that's the biggest thing. There's a, a counseling, a career counseling theory called happenstance. Uh, which is, I, I like to think of it as creative risk taking. So saying yes to certain opportunities, not sure where they lead, but why not? Right. And, and is it, that what happens when one of your students, they're feeling really anxious and they don't get the internship that they want? Is that the type of advice that you give to them at that time? Yeah, definitely. Focus on the skills that you want to learn that will get you where you want to go. So right. if you have this very visual picture of what you want to do after graduation, what what's going to help you get a step closer? Maybe it's not that dream company. Maybe it's a specific role or a specific type of experience. Uh, maybe you need to change the job title you were looking for and be open to new things. Um, but also being able to string those experiences together in a cohesive story. Uh, that's also where I love my role in resume writing and interview coaching is because it's the storytelling, how you connect those dots for the employer that really sells you out of all the other candidates. That's such great advice too. And it goes back to really your journey because where you've started and you've had to learn your own skills and strategies just to find peace and happiness within yourself then be able to find a career that suits your creative nature, allows you to communicate and still connect um, on a really meaningful basis for yourself in terms of being able to help people be calm and use your, your information, your wisdom about um, mental health and, and good healthy practices 
and paying it forward so those students are able to then really look at themselves, their life and as a whole, and then where they want to go so they can make that next step. I believe that's a big part of where you've been and where you are. Yeah, it's it's our it's my narrative, right? Yeah. It's yeah. what I've chosen to tell myself about myself. Right. And I think that's one of the biggest things when it comes to mental health is it is all about the stories we tell ourselves, right? So like I said, uh, the par- the different parts of our personality, the different parts of our experiences, they inform how we view the world and how we view ourselves. So we have to shift those in order to grow. Uh, so whereas before I might've said, oh, I'm not great at school or I'm failing at this and this. Okay, well, I realized that's not where I wanted to focus. Uh, And it wasn't until a couple of years later that I was able to articulate that. So even when you're feeling uh, in kind of the deepest, darkest steps of anxiety or depression, it it will get better. And if you can focus on the lesson you're learning and the skills you're building, that will make you a better person. I feel like that's how I've been able to move forward. So focus on the lessons and skills that you're learning. And that applies to whether you have conditions or not, whether you're applying to colleges or not, is using what we know in the best way we can and surrounding ourselves with the support that's going to help you to get to that place. Just like Ashley said, you know, uh, even before we actually started recording, she said she was so grateful to be, to go to college. They had the services that she needed. They had the mental health counseling. They had a place to eat whenever she wanted to eat. Yippee. <laughs> she didn't have to cook. And they and they had a gym. So that way she can, you know, enjoy life too. And and uh, and all that the gym and working out had served her. So I think we have a number of lessons in here. Ashley, is there any last words to help us tie it all together that you would like to give our listeners? And this is where tying the dots and the narrative and storytelling really comes to yes. mind is wrapping it up into a theme or something. It, I, I think the, so often we define ourselves by the challenges uh, and the, the difficulties we face. It's like we're an adventurer, right? And we're going through all these levels and fighting all these boss battles. Well, what if you could actually befriend the boss and make it to the next level? And then you've got this really cool, awesome friend who's helping you beat even tougher people. Um, so it, it doesn't always have to be a struggle. Uh, it, it really is how you think about it and, uh, how you, how you talk to yourself about it, how you explain it to someone, uh, it, it doesn't have to be just this constant upward battle. If there's a level of acceptance, a level of curiosity or openness to befriending that part that you hate so much about yourself, it, it can really change things. Your self-narrative can make all the difference in the world. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, sharing some of those strategies with us, experiences, and giving you know children out there who are um, having their own struggles, and as well as those college students who may be feeling a little bit frustrated and just knowing that there's alternatives out there. And there's that self-narrative that's very important for your next step. So thank you very much. And for those of you listening, remember to like, subscribe, and share to help get this information out there. Thanks, Ashley. Thank you so much, Lisa. Take care, everyone. Thank you for listening to the Student Success Beyond Expectations podcast, where school leaders, educators, and parents meet on behalf of children who struggle with learning.